Chapter Seventeen of A Voyage to the South Sea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly. Chapter Seventeen. Passage from New Holland to the Island Timor. Arrive at Kapang. Reception there. June 1789. Wednesday. Three. At eight o'clock in the evening, we once more launched into the open ocean. Miserable as our situation was in every respect, I was secretly surprised to see that it did not appear to affect any one so strongly as myself. On the contrary, it seemed as if they had embarked on a voyage to Timor in a vessel sufficiently calculated for safety and convenience. So much confidence gave me great pleasure, and I may venture to assert that to this cause our preservation is chiefly to be attributed. I encouraged every one with hopes that eight or ten days would bring us to a land of safety, and, after praying to God for a continuance of his most gracious protection, I served an allowance of water for supper, and directed our course to the west-southwest to counteract the southerly winds in case they should blow strong. We had been just six days on the coast of New Holland, in the course of which we found oysters, a few clams, some birds, and water. But perhaps a benefit nearly equal to this we received by having been relieved from the fatigue of being constantly in the boat and enjoying good rest at night. These advantages certainly preserved our lives, and, small as the supply was, I am very sensible how much it alleviated our distresses. By this time nature must have sunk under the extremes of hunger and fatigue some would have ceased to struggle for a life that only promised wretchedness and misery and others though possessed of more bodily strength must soon have followed their unfortunate companions even in our present situation we were the most deplorable objects but the hopes of a speedy relief kept up our spirits for my own part incredible as it may appear i felt neither extreme hunger nor thirst my allowance contented me, knowing I could have no more. Thursday, 4. I served one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread and an allowance of water for breakfast, and the same for dinner with an addition of six oysters to each person. At noon, latitude observed, 10 degrees 48 minutes south, course since yesterday noon, south 81 degrees west, distance 111 miles. Longitude by account from Shoal Cape, 1 degree 45 minutes west. A strong trade wind at east-southeast with fair weather. This day we saw a number of water snakes that were ringed yellow and black, and towards noon we passed a great deal of rock weed. Though the weather was fair, we were constantly shipping water, which kept two men always employed to bail the boat. Friday, 5. At noon I observed in latitude 10 degrees 45 minutes south, our course since yesterday west one quarter north, 108 miles, longitude made 3 degrees 35 minutes west. Six oysters were, as yesterday, served to each man in addition to the usual allowance of bread and water. In the evening a few boobies came about us, one of which I caught with my hand. The blood was divided among three of the men who were weakest, but the bird I ordered to be kept for our dinner the next day. Served a quarter of a pint of water for supper, and to some who were most in need, half a pint. In the course of the night, being constantly wet with the sea, we suffered much cold and shiverings. Saturday, 6. At daylight I found that some of the clams which had been hung up to dry for sea store were stolen, but every one solemnly denied having any knowledge of it. This forenoon we saw a gannet, a sand lark, and some water snakes, which in general were from two to three feet long. The usual allowance of bread and water was served for breakfast, and the same for dinner with the bird, which I distributed in the usual way of who shall have this. I propose to make to more about the latitude of 9 degrees 30 minutes south, or 10 degrees south. At noon I observed the latitude to be 10 degrees 19 minutes south, course north 77 degrees west, distance 117 miles, 
Longitude made from Shoal Cape, the north part of New Holland, 5 degrees 31 minutes west. In the afternoon I took an opportunity of examining our store of bread and found remaining 19 days allowance at the former rate of serving one twenty-fifth of a pound three times a day. Therefore, as I saw every prospect of a quick passage, I again ventured to grant an allowance for supper, agreeable to my promise at the time it was discontinued. Sunday, 7. We passed the night miserably wet and cold, and in the morning I heard heavy complaints. The sea was high and breaking over us. I could only afford the allowance of bread and water for breakfast, but for dinner I gave out an ounce of dried clams to each person, which was all that remained. At noon I altered the course to west-northwest to keep more from the sea, as the wind blew strong. Latitude observed 9 degrees 31 minutes south, course north 57 degrees west, distance 88 miles, longitude made 6 degrees 46 minutes west. The sea ran very high all this day, and we had frequent showers of rain so that we were continually wet and suffered much cold in the night. Mr. Ledward, the surgeon, and Lawrence Lebeau, an old hardy seaman, appeared to be giving way very fast. I could only assist them by a teaspoon or two of wine, which I had carefully saved, expecting such a melancholy necessity. Monday, 8. Wind at southeast. The weather was more moderate than it had been for some days past. A few gannets were seen. At noon, I observed in 8 degrees 45 minutes south, course west-northwest, one-quarter west, 106 miles, Longitude made 8 degrees 23 minutes west. The sea being smooth, I steered west by south. At four in the afternoon we caught a small dolphin, which was the first relief of the kind that we obtained. I issued about two ounces to each person, including the offals, and saved the remainder for dinner the next day. Towards evening the wind freshened and it blew strong all night, so that we shipped much water and suffered greatly from the wet and cold. Tuesday, 9. At daylight as usual I heard much complaining, which my own feelings convinced me was too well founded. I gave the surgeon and Lebeau a little wine, but I could afford them no further relief except encouraging them with hopes that a very few days longer, at our present fine rate of sailing, would bring us to Timor. Gannets, boobies, men of war, and tropic birds were constantly about us. Served the usual allowance of bread and water, and at noon we dined on the remains of the dolphin, which amounted to about an ounce per man. I observed the latitude to be 9 degrees 9 minutes south, longitude made 10 degrees 8 minutes west, course since yesterday noon, south 76 degrees west, distance 107 miles. This afternoon I suffered great sickness from the nature of part of the stomach of the fish which had fallen to my share at dinner. At sunset served an allowance of bread and water for supper. Wednesday, 10. In the morning, after a very comfortless night, there was a visible alteration for the worse and many of the people which gave me great apprehensions. An extreme weakness, swelled legs, hollow and ghastly countenances, a more than common inclination to sleep, with an apparent debility of understanding, seemed to me the melancholy presages of an approaching dissolution. The surgeon and Le Boy, in particular, were most miserable objects. I occasionally gave them a few teaspoonsfuls of wine out of the little that remained, which greatly assisted them. The hopes of being able to accomplish the voyage was our principal support. The boatswain very innocently told me that he really thought I looked worse than anyone in the boat. The simplicity with which he uttered such an opinion amused me, and I returned him a better compliment. Our latitude at noon was 9 degrees 16 minutes south. Longitude from the north part of New Holland 12 degrees 1 minute west. Course since yesterday noon west half south 111 miles. Birds and rockweed showed that we were not far from land, but I expected such signs here, as there are many islands between the east part of Timor and New Guinea. The night was more moderate than the last. Thursday, 11. 
every one received the customary allowance of bread and water, and an extra allowance of water was given to those who were most in need. At noon I observed in latitude 9 degrees 41 minutes south, course 77 degrees west, distance 109 miles, longitude made 13 degrees 49 minutes west. I had little doubt of having now passed the meridian of the eastern part of Timor, which is laid down in 128 degrees east. This diffused universal joy and satisfaction. In the afternoon we saw gannets and many other birds, and at sunset we kept a very anxious lookout. In the evening we caught a booby which I reserved for our dinner the next day. Friday, 12. At three in the morning, with an excess of joy, we discovered some more bearing from west-southwest to west-northwest, and I hauled on a wind to the north-northeast till daylight, when the land bore from southwest by south, to northeast by north. Our distance from the shore, two leagues. It is not possible for me to describe the pleasure which the blessings of the sight of this land diffused among us. It appeared scarce credible to ourselves that, in an open boat and so poorly provided, we should have been able to reach the coast of Timor in forty-one days after leaving Tafoya, having in that time run, by our log, a distance of 3,618 miles, and that, notwithstanding our extreme distress, no one should have perished in the voyage. I have already mentioned that I knew not where the Dutch settlement was situated, but I had a faint idea it was at the southwest part of the island. I therefore, after daylight, bore away along shore to the south-southwest, which I was the more readily induced to do as the wind would not suffer us to go towards the northeast without great loss of time. The day gave us a most agreeable prospect of the land, which was interspersed with woods and lawns, the interior part mountainous, but the shore low. Towards noon the coast became higher with some remarkable headlands. We were greatly delighted with the general look of the country which exhibited many cultivated spots and beautiful situations, but we could only see a few small huts, whence I concluded that no European resided in this part of the island. Much sea ran on the shore which made landing impracticable. At noon we were abreast of a high headland, the extremes of the land bore southwest half-west and north-northeast half-east, our distance offshore being three miles, latitude by observation nine degrees fifty-nine minutes south, and my longitude by dead reckoning from the north part of New Holland, fifteen degrees six minutes west. With the usual allowance of bread and water for dinner, I divided the bird we had caught the night before, and to the surgeon and Le Beau I gave a little wine. The wind blew fresh at east and east-southeast with very hazy weather. During the afternoon we continued our course along a low shore covered with innumerable palm trees, called the fan palm from the leaf spreading like a fan, but here we saw no signs of cultivation, nor had the country so fine an appearance as to the eastward. This, however, was only a small tract, for by sunset it improved again, and I saw several great smokes where the inhabitants were clearing and cultivating their grounds. We had now run twenty-five miles to the west-southwest since noon, and were west five miles from a low point which, in the afternoon, I imagined had been the southernmost land, and here the coast formed a deep bend with low land in the bight that appeared like islands. The west shore was high, but from this part of the coast to the high cape which we were abreast of at noon, the shore is low and I believe shoal. I particularly remark this situation because here the very high ridge of the mountains that run from the east end of the island terminate, and the appearance of the country changes for the worse. That we might not run past any settlement in the night, I determined to preserve my situation till the morning, and therefore brought two under a close-reefed foresail. We were here in shoal water, our distance from the shore being half a league, the westernmost land in sight bearing west-southwest half-west. Served bread and water for supper, and the boat lying to very well, all but the officer of the watch endeavored to get a little sleep. Saturday, 
13. At two in the morning we wore, and stood in shore till daylight when I found we had drifted during the night about three leagues to the west-southwest, the southernmost land in sight bearing west. On examining the coast, and not seeing any sign of a settlement, we bore away to the westward, having a strong gale against a weather current which occasioned much sea. The shore was high and covered with wood, but we did not run far before low land again formed the coast, the points of which opening at west, I once more fancied we were on the south part of the island, but at ten o'clock we found the coast again inclining towards the south, part of it bearing west, southwest, half-west. At the same time high land appeared in the southwest, but the weather was so hazy that it was doubtful whether the two lands were separated, the opening only extending one point of the compass. For this reason I stood towards the outer land and found it to be the island Roti. I returned to the shore we had left and brought to a grapnel in the sandy bay that I might more conveniently calculate my situation. In this place we saw several smokes where the natives were clearing their grounds. During the little time we remained here the master and carpenter very much importuned me to let them go in search of supplies, to which at length I assented, but, not finding any other person willing to be of their party, they did not choose to quit the boat. I stopped here no longer than for the purpose just mentioned, and we continued steering along shore. We had a view of a beautiful-looking country as if formed by art into lawns and parks. The coast is low and covered with woods in which are innumerable fan-palm trees that look like coconut walks. The interior part is highland, but very different from the more eastern parts of the island, where it is exceedingly mountainous and to appearance the soil better. At noon the island Roti bore southwest by west seven leagues. I had no observation for the latitude, but by account we were in ten degrees twelve minutes south, our course since yesterday noon being south seventy-seven degrees west, fifty-four miles. The usual allowance of bread and water was served for breakfast and dinner, and to the surgeon and Lebeau I continued to give wine. We had a strong breeze at east-southeast with hazy weather all the afternoon. At two o'clock, having run through a very dangerous breaking sea, the cause of which I attributed to be a strong tide setting to windward and shoal water, we discovered a spacious bay or sound with a fair entrance about two or three miles wide. I now conceived hopes that our voyage was nearly at an end as no place could appear more eligible for shipping or more likely to be chosen for a European settlement. I therefore came to a grapnel near the east side of the entrance in a small sandy bay where we saw a hut, a dog, and some cattle, and I immediately set the boatswain and gunner away to the hut to discover the inhabitants. The southwest point of the entrance bore west half south three miles, the southeast point south by west three quarters of a mile, and the island Rotai from south by west one quarter west to southwest one quarter west about five leagues as we lay there i found the ebb came from the northward and before our departure the falling of the tide discovered to us a reef of rocks about two cables length from the shore the whole being covered at high water renders it dangerous on the opposite shore there appeared very high breakers but there is nevertheless plenty of room and certainly a safe channel for a first-rate man of war the bay or sound within seemed to be of considerable extent, the northern part being about five leagues distant. Here the land made in moderate risings joined by lower grounds. But the island Rote to the southward is the best mark by which to know this place. I had just time to make these remarks when I saw the boatswain and gunner returning with some of the natives. I therefore no longer doubted of our success and that our expectations would be fully gratified. They brought five Indians, and informed me they had found two families where the women treated them with European politeness. From these people I learned that the governor resided in a place called Kapang, which was some distance to the northeast. I made signs for one of them to go in the boat and show us the way to Kapang, intimating that I would pay him for his troubles, the man readily complied and came into the boat. 
These people were of a dark tawny color, had long black hair, and chewed a great deal of beetle. Their dress was a square piece of cloth round the hips, in the folds of which was stuck a large knife, a handkerchief wrapped round the head, and another hanging by the four corners from the shoulders, which served as a bag for their beetle equipage. They brought us a few pieces of dried turtle and some ears of Indian corn. This last was the most welcome, for the turtle was so hard that it could not be eaten without being first soaked in hot water. They offered to bring us some other refreshments if I would wait, but as the pilot was willing, I determined to push on. It was about half an hour past four when we sailed. By the direction of the pilot, we kept close to the east shore under all our sail, but as night came on, the wind died away, and we were obliged to try at the oars, which I was surprised to see we could use with some effect. At ten o'clock, finding we advanced but slowly, I came to a grapnel, and for the first time I issued double allowance of bread and a little wine to each person. Sunday, 14. At one o'clock in the morning, after the most happy and sweet sleep that ever men enjoyed, we weighed and continued to keep the east shore on board in very smooth water, when at last we found we were again open to the sea, the whole of the land to the westward that we had passed being an island which the pilot called Pulo Samo. The northern entrance of this channel was about a mile and a half, or two miles wide, and I had no ground at ten fathoms. The report of two cannon that were fired gave new life to everyone, and soon after we discovered two square-rigged vessels and a cutter at anchor to the eastward. We endeavored to work to windward, but were obliged to take to our oars again, having lost ground on each tack. We kept close to the shore and continued rowing, until four o'clock when I brought to a grapnel and gave another allowance of bread and wine to all hands. As soon as we had rested a little, we weighed again and rowed till near daylight when we came to a grapnel off a small fort in town which the pilot told me was Kapang. Among the things which the boatswain had thrown into the boat before we left the ship was a bundle of signal flags that had been used by the boats to show the depth of the water and soundings. With these we had in the course of the passage made a small jack, which I now hoisted in the main shrouds as a signal of distress, for I did not think it proper to land without leave. Soon after daybreak a soldier hailed us to land, which I immediately did among a crowd of Indians, and was agreeably surprised to meet with an English sailor who belonged to one of the vessels in the road. His captain told me he was the second person in the town. I therefore desired to be conducted to him, as I was informed the governor was ill and could not be spoken with. Captain Spikerman received me with great humanity. I informed him of our distressed situation and requested the care might be taken of those who were with me without delay on which he gave directions for their immediate reception at his own house, and went himself to the governor to know at what time I could be permitted to see him, which was fixed to be eleven o'clock. I now desired my people to come on shore, which was as much as some of them could do, being scarce able to walk. They, however, were helped to the house, and found tea with bread and butter provided for their breakfast. The abilities of a painter perhaps, could seldom have been displayed to more advantage than in the delineation of the two groups of figures which at this time presented themselves to each other. An indifferent spectator would have been at a loss which most to admire, the eyes of famine sparkling at immediate relief, or the horror of their preservers at the sight of so many spectres whose ghastly countenances, if the cause had been unknown, would rather have excited terror than pity. Our bodies were nothing but skin and bones, our limbs were full of sores, and we were clothed in rags. In this condition, with the tears of joy and gratitude flowing down our cheeks, the people of Timor beheld us with a mixture of horror, surprise, and pity. The governor, Mr. William Adrian Van Est, notwithstanding extreme ill health, became so anxious about us that I saw him before the appointed time. He received me with great affection and gave me the fullest proofs that he was possessed of every feeling of a humane and good man. Sorry as he was, he said, that such a calamity could ever have happened to us, 
yet he considered it to be the greatest blessing of his life that we had fallen under his protection and though his infirmity was so great that he could not do the office of a friend himself he would give such orders as i might be certain would procure us every supply we wanted a house should be immediately prepared for me and with respect to my people he said that i might have room for them either at the hospital or on board of captain spikerman's ship which lay in the road and he expressed much uneasiness that capang could not afford them better accommodations the house being assigned to me being the only one uninhabited and the situation of the few families that lived at this place such that they could not conveniently receive strangers for the present till matters could be properly regulated he gave direction that victuals for my people should be dressed at his own house on returning to captain sparkerman's house i found that every kind of relief had been given to my people the surgeon had dressed their sores and the cleaning of their persons had not been less attended to several friendly gifts of apparel having been presented to them i desired to be shown to the house that was intended for me which i found ready with servants to attend it consisted of a hall with a room at each end and a loft overhead and was surrounded by a piazza with an outer apartment in one corner and a communication from the back part of the house to the street i therefore determined instead of separating from my people to lodge them all with me and i divided the house as follows one room i took to myself the other i allotted to the master surgeon mr nelson and the gunner and the loft to the other officers and the outer apartment to the men the hall was common to the officers and the men had the back piazza of this disposition i informed the governor and he sent down chairs tables and benches with bedding and other necessaries for the use of every one the governor when i took my leave had desired me to acquaint him with everything of which i stood in need but it was only at particular times that he had a few moments of ease or could attend to anything being in a dying state with an incurable disease on this account i transacted whatever business i had with mr timotheus wanjon the second of this place who was the governor's son-in-law and who also contributed everything in his power to make our situation comfortable i had been therefore misinformed by the seaman who told me that captain spikerman was the next person in command to the governor at noon a dinner was brought to the house sufficiently good to make persons more accustomed to plenty eat too much yet i believe few in such a situation would have observed more moderation than my people did my greatest apprehension was that they would eat too much fruit of which there was a great variety in season at this time having seen every one enjoy this meal of plenty i dined myself with mr wanjon but i felt no extraordinary inclination to eat or drink rest and quiet i considered as more necessary to the re-establishment of my health and therefore retired soon to my room which i found furnished with every convenience but instead of rest my mind was disposed to reflect on our late sufferings and on the failure of the expedition but above all in the thanks due to almighty god who had given us power to support and bear such heavy calamities and had enabled me at last to be the means of saving eighteen lives in times of difficulty there will generally arise circumstances that bear particularly hard on a commander in our late situation it was not the least of my distresses to be constantly assailed with the melancholy demands of my people for an increase of allowance which it grieved me to refuse the necessity of observing the most rigid economy in the distribution of our provisions was so evident that i resisted their solicitations and never deviated from the agreement we made at setting out the consequence of this care was that at our arrival we had still remaining sufficient for eleven days at our scanty allowance and if we had been so unfortunate as to have missed the dutch settlement at timor we could have proceeded to java where i was certain that every supply we wanted could be procured another disagreeable circumstance to which my situation exposed me was the caprice of ignorant people had i been incapable of acting they would have carried the boat on shore as soon as we made the island of timor without considering that landing among the natives at a distance 
from the European settlement might have been as dangerous as among any other Indians. The quantity of provisions with which we left the ship was not more than we should have consumed in five days had there been no necessity for husbanding our stock. The mutineers must naturally have concluded that we could have no other place of refuge than the friendly islands, for it was not likely they should imagine that, so poorly equipped as we were in every respect, there could have been a possibility of our attempting to return homewards. Much less can they suspect that the account of their villainy has already reached their native country. When I reflect how providentially our lives were saved at Tafoya by the Indians delaying their attack, and that, with scarce anything to support life, we crossed a sea of more than 1,200 leagues without shelter from the inclemency of the weather, when I reflect that in an open boat with so much stormy weather we escaped foundering, that not any of us were taken off by disease, that we had the great good fortune to pass the unfriendly natives of other countries without accident, and at last happily to meet with the most friendly and best of people to relieve our distresses. I say when I reflect on all these wonderful escapes, the remembrance of such great mercies enables me to bear, with resignation and cheerfulness, the failure of an expedition, the success of which I had so much at heart, and which was frustrated at a time when I was congratulating myself on the fairest prospect of being able to complete it in a manner that would fully have answered the intention of His Majesty and the humane promoters of so benevolent a plan. With respect to the preservation of our health during the course of sixteen days of heavy and almost continual rain, I would recommend to everyone in a similar situation the method we practiced, which is to dip their clothes in the salt water and wring them out as often as they become filled with rain. It was the only resource we had, and I believe was of the greatest service to us, for it felt more like a change of dry clothes than could well be imagined. We had occasion to do this so often that at length all our clothes were wrung to pieces, for, except the few days we passed on the coast of New Holland, we were continually wet either with rain or sea. Thus, through the assistance of divine providence, we surmounted the difficulties and distresses of a most perilous voyage, and arrived safe in an hospitable port, where every necessary and comfort were administered to us with a most liberal hand. End of chapter 17「A Voyage to the South Sea」by William Bly Chapter 18 At Kapang June 1789 Timor From the great humanity and attention of the governor and the gentlemen at Kapang we received every kind of assistance and were not long without evident signs of returning health. Shortly after our arrival I presented to the governor a formal account of the loss of the bounty, and a requisition in His Majesty's name that instructions might be sent to all the Dutch settlements to stop the ship if she made her appearance. With this a complete descriptive list of the mutineers was given. I likewise requested at one of my first visits to the governor that Nelson might have permission to walk about the country in search of plants, which was readily granted with an offer of whatever assistance I should think necessary. And the governor assured me that the country was well worth examination, as it abounded with many curious and medicinal plants. From this indulgence I derived no benefit, for Nelson, who since we left New Holland had been but in a weak condition, about this time was taken ill in consequence of a cold caused by imprudently leaving off warm clothing. To secure our arrival at Batavia before the October fleet sailed for Europe, I gave public notice of my intention to hire a vessel to carry us to Batavia. In consequence of this notice, several offers were made, but none that I thought reasonable, which determined me to purchase a small schooner in the road that was thirty-four feet long, 
for which I gave one thousand rix dollars, and fitted her for sea under the name of His Majesty's Schooner Resource. As the coast of Java is frequently infested with small piratical vessels, it was necessary that we should be provided with the proper means of defence. In this I was assisted by the friendship of Mr. Wanjon, who supplied me with four brass swivels, fourteen stand of small arms, and ammunition, which he obligingly let me have as a loan to be returned at Bativia. July 20 on the twentieth of july i had the misfortune to lose mr david nelson he died of an inflammatory fever the loss of this honest man i very much lamented he had with great care and diligence attended to the object for which he was sent and had always been ready to forward every plan that was proposed for the good of the service in which we were engaged he was not less useful on our voyage hither in the course of which he gave me great satisfaction by the patience and fortitude with which he conducted himself july twenty one this day i was employed attending the funeral of mr nelson the corpse was carried by twelve soldiers dressed in black preceded by the minister next followed myself and the second governor then ten gentlemen of the town and the officers of the ships in the harbour and after them my own officers and people after reading our burial service the body was interred behind the chapel and the burying ground appropriated to the europeans of the town i was sorry i could get no tombstone to place over his remains this was the second voyage mr nelson had undertaken to the south seas having been sent out by sir joseph banks to collect plants seeds etc in captain cook's last voyage and now after surmounting so many difficulties and in the midst of thankfulness for his deliverance he was called upon to pay the debt of nature at the time least expected august twenty our schooner being victualled and ready for sea on the twentieth of august i took an affectionate leave of the hospitable and friendly inhabitants of kapang and embarked in the afternoon we sailed having the launch which had so much contributed to our preservation in tow we exchanged salutes with the fort and shipping as we ran out of the harbour the town of kapang is situated in a great bay which is an excellent road for shipping the latitude of the town is ten degrees twelve minutes south according to the dutch charts it is in one hundred twenty one degrees fifty one minutes east longitude taking the mean between the longitude by my reckoning on our arrival at kapang and the longitude afterwards calculated from our run to bativia gives me for the longitude of kapang one hundred twenty four degrees forty one minutes east the settlement was formed in the year sixteen thirty and is the only one the dutch have on the island timor they have residents in different parts of the country on the north side of timor there is a portuguese settlement the product of the island is chiefly sandalwood and beeswax the former article is now scarce wax they have in great plenty the bees build their nests in bushes and in the boughs of trees to which the natives cannot approach but with fire the honey is put into jars and the wax is run into blocks of three feet in length and from twelve to fifteen inches square the natives at least those who live in the neighbourhood of kapang are of a very indolent disposition of which the chinese have taken advantage for though the malays are very fond of traffic most of their trade is carried on in small chinese vessels of from ten to thirty tons burden there is a market at kapang for the country people in which however there is little business done i have seen a man from the country come to market with two potatoes and this is not unusual these being sold for two doits equal to a halfpenny english serve to supply him with beetle to chew and the rest of the day is passed in lounging about the town the inland people who live at a distance from the europeans are strong and active but their want of cleanliness subjects them to filthy diseases the chief of the natives or king of the island is by the dutch styled kafir emperor this prince lives at a place called Bakanazi, about four miles distant from Kapang. His authority over the natives is not wholly undisputed, 
which is by the Dutch attributed to the intrigues of the Portuguese, who are on the north part of Timor. The island has lately suffered much by a competition between the present king and one of his nephews, which caused a civil war that lasted from the beginning of the year 1786 to 1788, when their differences were settled by a treaty chiefly in favor of the king. The ravages committed in these disputes have occasioned a scarcity of provisions that probably, from the want of industry in the natives, will not soon be remedied. I had an opportunity of making a visit to the king. His dwelling was a large house which was divided into only three apartments and surrounded by a piazza, agreeably situated but very dirty, as was all the furniture. The king, who is an elderly man, received me with much civility and ordered refreshments to be set before me, which were tea, rice cake, roasted Indian corn, and dried buffalo flesh, with about a pint of arrack, which I believe was all he had. His dress was a check wrapper girded round his waist with a silk and gold belt, a loose linen jacket, and a coarse handkerchief about his head. A few of his chiefs were with him who partook of our repast, after which the king retired with three of them for a short time, and when he returned presented me with a round plate of metal about four inches diameter, on which was stamped the figure of a star. As I had been informed that Erech would be an acceptable present, I was prepared to make a return which was well received. They never dilute their liquor, and from habit are able to drink a large quantity of spirits at a time without being intoxicated. When a king dies, a large feast is made to which all the inhabitants are invited. The body, after a few days, is put into a coffin which is closed up and kept three years before it is interned. The Dutch have been at some pains to establish Christianity among the natives, but it has not gained much ground, except in the neighborhood of Capang. The present king was christened by the name Barnardus. His Indian name is Bakchi Banok. The scriptures are translated into the Malay language, and prayers are performed in the church at Kapang by a Malay clergyman in that language. I met at Timor with most of the fruits that are described in Captain Cook's first voyage as natives of Batavia, except the mangosteen. The breadfruit tree, called by the Malays Sokom, likewise grows here with great luxuriance and appears to be as much a native of this island as it is of Otaheite. The fruit is exactly of the same kind, but not so good. A breadfruit of Timor weighs half as much more as one of equal size at Otaheite. It is not used here as bread, but generally eaten with milk and sugar. At Bacchanassi I saw about twenty of the trees, larger than any I had seen at Otaheite. Here also is a sort of breadfruit tree that produces seeds not unlike Windsor beans and equally palatable, either boiled or roasted. No other part of the fruit is edible, and though the tree, I am told, is to all appearances the same as the other, the fruits have but little resemblance, the fruit of this being covered with projecting points nearly half an inch in length. I received a present of some fine plants from the governor, which I was afterwards unfortunately obliged to leave at Batavia for want of proper room to take care of them in the packet by which I returned to Europe. Mr. Wanjon likewise favoured me with some seeds for His Majesty's garden at Kew, which I had the good fortune to deliver safe on my return, and some of the mountain rice cultivated at Timor on the dry land, which was forwarded to His Majesty's Botanic Garden at St. Vincent, and to other parts in the West Indies. A resemblance of language between the people of the South Sea Islands and the inhabitants of many of the islands in the East Indies has been remarked in Captain Cook's first voyage. Here the resemblance appeared stronger than has yet been noticed, particularly in their numerals. But besides the language I observe some customs among the people of Timor, still more striking for their similarity. They practice the Tuugi Tuugi. Footnote. The Tuugi Tuugi is described in Captain Cook's Last Voyage, Volume 1, page 323, and the Ru'e'e in the same voyage, Volume 2, page 64. End of footnote. 
They practiced the Tuugi Tuugi of the friendly islands which they call Tum Bok and the Rum Ee of Otaheite which they call Ramas. I likewise saw, placed on their graves, offerings of baskets with tobacco and beetle. I left the governor, Mr. Van Esty, at the point of death. To this gentleman our most gracious thanks are due for the humane and friendly treatment that we received from him. His ill state of health only prevented him from showing us more particular marks of attention. Unhappily, it is to his memory only that I now pay this tribute. It was a fortunate circumstance for us that Mr. Wanjon, the next in place to the governor, was equally humane and ready to relieve us. His attention was unremitting, and, when there was a doubt about supplying me with money to enable me to purchase a vessel, he cheerfully took it upon himself, without which it was evident I should have been too late at Bactivia to have sailed for Europe with the October fleet. I can only return such services by ever retaining a grateful remembrance of them. Mr. Max, the town surgeon, likewise behaved to us with the most disinterested humanity. He attended every one with the utmost care, for which I could not prevail on him to receive any payment, or to render me any account or other answer than that it was his duty. End of chapter 18「at daylight we saw the island Flores to the northward. At noon, latitude observed 9 degrees 27 minutes south, and longitude by account from Kupang 2 degrees 10 minutes west. Our distance from the coast of Flores was about 10 leagues, and two high-peaked mountains bore north half-east and north-northwest. These two mountains resemble each other in shape, and the westernmost is a volcano. The interior parts of Flores are mountainous and woody, but near the coastland is a fine open country. A Dutch map with which I was provided places the south part of Flores in 9 degrees 3 minutes south, which I am of the opinion is too far south. We steered along the south side of Flores, mostly with light winds and hazy weather, so that we did not constantly keep sight of the coast. Tuesday, 25. At noon we were off Tourne's Island, which bore northwest by north three or four leagues distant. Our latitude observed was eight degrees fifty seven minutes south, and longitude made by dead reckoning from Kapang three degrees twenty seven minutes west. Tourne's Island is about four leagues in circuit, and has a craggy and uneven appearance. There is a curious high peak on the southwest part. The land near the shore is low and woody. Thursday, 27. On the 27th at noon, we were near the entrance of the Straits of Mangarin, which, not appearing so open and clear as represented in the map, I steered for the Straits of Sapi, intending to pass through, but was obliged to give up this plan by strong current setting to the southeast, which there was not sufficient wind to enable us to stem. Saturday, 29. I therefore again stood for the Straits of Magaren, which we ran through in the afternoon of the 29th, being favored with a fresh breeze from the south-southeast. On our first entering the Straits, we got close to the Flores shore. Our course through was north half-east. We tried for soundings, but could not anywhere find bottom at 25 and 30 fathoms depth. On the Flores side there are many good harbors and bays where vessels may anchor, but the country hereabouts appears burn up and desolate. I had no azimuth compass and consequently could not observe very accurately the variation, but I believe there is so little in Mangarin Straits that no great error will be occasioned by considering the true and magnetic bearings to be the same. When we had passed the straits we kept to the westward, running along the north side of the island Sumbawa, 
where there is a very high mountain near the coast at the foot of which i am informed are many runs of good water conveniently situated for ships to supply themselves the latitude of the north part of sabawa i make by my observations and bearings to be eight degrees six minutes south which differs very little from the dutch charts monday thirty one in the night of the thirty first several prows were rowing about us on which account we kept all night under arms september thursday three this and the two following days we were sailing along the north side of the island Lombok, on which there is a high mountain. Most of the islands in this route are distinguished by high mountains. Lombok appears to be well clothed with wood. In the nights we saw fires upon the high lands at a distance from the coast. Sunday, 6. In the afternoon we saw the high land of Cape Sandana, which is the northeast part of Java. Monday, seven the next day we were off cape sandana which is a low cape projecting from the highland already mentioned this cape is placed by the dutch maps in seven degrees fifty two minutes south but according to my observation and our estimated distance from the land i make it in seven degrees forty six minutes south latitude the longitude by my dead reckoning from kapang to cape sandana was eleven degrees thirty three minutes west thursday ten we steered to the westward along the coast of java and on the tenth at noon we anchored off passowerwang a dutch settlement on the coast of java and two fathoms distant from the shore half a league the entrance of the river bearing southwest the coast hereabouts is so shoal that large ships are obliged to anchor three or four miles from the land as soon as we were at anchor i got in my boat and went on shore the banks of the river near the entrance were mud on which grew a few mangrove bushes among them we saw hogs running and many were lying dead in the mud which caused a most intolerable stench and made me heartily repent having come here but after proceeding about a mile up the river the course of which was serpentine we found a very pleasant country and landed at a small and well-constructed fort where i was received in a friendly and polite manner by m adrian van rye the commandant by the return of the boat i sent on board a small bullock and other provisions i likewise took a pilot to conduct us to sarabaya the houses of Passarang are neatly built and the country appears to be well cultivated the product of the settlement is rice of which they export large quantities there are but few dutch here the javanese are numerous and their chief lives with considerable splendor they have good roads and posts are established along the coast and it appears to be a busy and well-regulated settlement latitude seven degrees thirty six minutes south longitude one degree forty four minutes west of cape sandana friday eleven the next day about noon we sailed saturday twelve and on the twelfth in the evening anchored in sanbaya road in seven fathoms the flagstaff bearing south one quarter west distance from the shore one mile we found riding here seven square rigged and several smaller vessels it was too late when we anchored to send the boat on shore sunday thirteen the next morning before daylight three guard boats stationed themselves near us and i was informed that i must not land or send a boat on shore this restriction i learned from the officer of the guard boats was in conformity to general orders concerning all strange vessels on their first arrival at nine in the forenoon leave came off for us to land and soon after the guard boats quitted us i was received on shore with great civility and friendship by the governor or upper host m and barquet and the commandant of the troops m de bois by these gentlemen i was hospitably entertained and advised to remain till the sixteenth when some vessels were to sail with whom i might keep company which they recommend on account of pirates sarabaya is one of the most pleasant places i ever saw it is situated on the banks of a river and is a mile and a half distant from the seashore so that only the flagstaff can be seen from the road 
the river is navigable up to the town for vessels of one hundred tons burden and the bank on one side is made convenient for tracking the chinese carry on a considerable trade here and have a town or camp on the side of the river opposite to sobaya the country near the bay is flat and the soil light so that they plough with a single bullock or buffalo carabo the interior parts of the country near the mountains are infested with a breed of fierce tigers which makes travelling inland very dangerous they have here a breed of horses which are small but they are handsome and strong the javanese in this neighbourhood are numerous m barquet and m de bose took me with them to pay a visit to two of the principal natives whom we found attended by a number of men armed with pikes in great military order we were entertained with a concert of music the instruments were gongs drums and a fiddle with two strings i hired a pilot here to carry us to batavia our latitude observed in saboya road was seven degrees eleven minutes south longitude made from cape sandana one degree fifty two minutes west thursday seventeen on the seventeenth we sailed from saboya in company with three prows at noon we anchored at Crissy, which is a town with a small fort belonging to the Dutch. We remained here about two hours and then weighed. Latitude of Crissy, seven degrees nine minutes south. Longitude from Cape Sandana, one degree fifty five minutes west. The navigation through the Straits of Madura is so intricate that with the little opportunity I had, I am unable to undertake a description of it. Friday, 18. The next day, having passed the straits, we bore away to the westward along the coast of Java in company with the prows before mentioned. Tuesday, 22. We had regular soundings all the way to Samarang, off which place we anchored on the 22nd in the afternoon, the church bearing southeast, distance from the shore half a league, depth of water two fathoms the shoalness of the coast here makes the road of samarang very inconvenient both on account of the great distance that large ships of which there were several in the road are obliged to lay from the shore and of the landing which is in a river that cannot be entered before half flood this river resembles the one at passerwang the shores being low with offensive dead animals laying about i was met at the landing place by the equipage master and he furnished me with a carriage to carry me to the governor whose residence is about two miles from the town of samarang i requested and obtained leave to have our wants supplied which were to recruit our provisions and get a mainmast having sprung ours in the passage from sarabaya samarang is a fortified town surrounded by a wall and ditch and is the most considerable settlement next to batavia that the dutch have in java there is a very good hospital and a public school chiefly for teaching the mathematics they likewise have a theatre provisions are remarkably cheap here beef being at ten duets per pound and the price of a fowl twelve duets i experience great civility from some of the gentlemen of samarang particularly from m le baron de bose a merchant brother to the m de bose commandant of the troops at sourabaya and from m abeg the surgeon of the hospital to whom we were indebted for advice and medicines for which he would not consent to receive payment the latitude of samarang is six degrees fifty seven minutes longitude by my reckoning from cape sandana four degrees seven minutes west saturday twenty six on the twenty sixth we sailed from samarang and with this a galley mounting six swivels which the governor had directed to accompany us to batavia october thursday one on the first of october we anchored in batavia road where we found riding a dutch ship of war and twenty sail of dutch east india ships besides many smaller vessels end of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of A Voyage to the South Sea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly. Chapter 20. Occurrences at Batavia and Passage Thence to England. October 1789. In the afternoon at four o'clock I went on shore, and landed at a house by the river where strangers first stop and give an account who they are, whence they came, etc. From this place a Malay gentleman took me in a carriage to Sabandar. Mr. Englehart, whose house was in the environs of the city on the side nearest the shipping. The Sabandar is the officer with whom all strangers are obliged to transact their business. At least the whole must go through his hands. With him I went to pay my respects to the Governor-General, who received me with great civility. I acquainted His Excellency with my situation, and requested my people might be taken care of, and that we would be allowed to take a passage to Europe in the first ship that sailed. I likewise desired permission to sell the schooner and launch. All this, His Excellency told me, should be granted. I then took leave and returned with the Sabandar, who wrote down the particulars of my wants in order to form from them a regular petition to be presented to the consul the next day. I had brought from the governor of Copang, directed for the governor-general at Batavia, the account of my voyage and misfortune, translated into Dutch from an account that I had given to Mr. Van Est. So attentive had they been at Timor to everything that related to us. There is a large hotel at Batavia fitted up purposely for the accommodation of strangers, who are not allowed to reside at any other place. It is situated near the great river in a part of the city that is reckoned the most airy and healthy. Nevertheless, I found the air hot and suffocating, and was taken ill in the night with a violent pain in my head. Friday, 2. The next morning at nine the council sat and I attended, accompanied by the Sabandar, and was informed that the council had complied with all that I had requested. When I returned to the hotel my headache increased and a violent fever came on. I sent to acquaint the Sabandar of my situation, and was soon after attended by the head surgeon of the town hospital, Mr. Onsorp, by whose care and skill, in less than twenty-four hours, the fever considerably abated, but a severe headache continued. I had an invitation from the Governor-General to dine with him, which of course I was obliged to decline. I hired a carriage which cost three dollars per day, for the benefit of taking an airing. My lodgings at the hotel were so close and hot that I desired the Sabandar to apply to the Governor-General for leave to hire a house in the country, which request His Excellency not only immediately complied with, but gave directions for my being accommodated at the house of the physician or Surgeon General, Mr. Sparling. One of my people, Thomas Hall, being ill with a flux, I obtained leave for him to be sent to the country hospital, which is a convenient, airy building. Tuesday, 6. This morning at sunrise I left the hotel and was carried to Mr. Sparling's house, about four miles distant from the city and near the convalescent hospital, which at this time also had sick men in it, the whole number of patients amounting to eight hundred. I found everything prepared for my comfort and convenience. Mr. Sparling would suffer me to take no medicine, though I had still considerable fever with headache, but I found so much relief from the difference of the air that in the evening I was able to accompany Mr. Sparling on a visit to the Governor-General at one of his country seats, where we found many ladies all dressed in the Malay fashion, some of them richly ornamented with jewels. I had invitations from several gentlemen, and some very kindly pressed me to make their country houses my abode until my health should be re-established. My indisposition increasing, Mr. Sparling advised me to quit Batavia as speedily as possible, and represented the necessity of it to the Governor-General. I was informed from His Excellency that the homeward-bound ships were so much crowded that there would be no possibility of all my people going in one ship, and that they could be accommodated no other way than by dividing them into different ships. 
Seeing therefore that a separation was unavoidable, I determined to follow the advice of the physician, and, as a packet was appointed to sail for Europe on the sixteenth instant, I sent a request to the governor that I might be allowed to take a passage in her for myself and as many as my people as they were able to receive. In answer to this I was acquainted that myself and two more could be accommodated in the packet, she being too small to admit a greater number, but that I might rest assured of passages being provided for those that remained at the earliest opportunities. Friday, 9. This day anchored in the road the General Elliot, an English ship commanded by Captain Lloyd. In the Straits of Banca he had met with some boats belonging to the East India Company's ship Vansitart that was lost in the Straits of Billiton by having struck on a rock that went through her bottom. Captain Wilson, who commanded the Vansitart, I was informed had just finished a survey of those straits and was hoisting his boat in when the ship struck. Immediately on receiving the intelligence, Captain Lloyd, in the General Elliot, and another ship and company called the Nunsuch, sailed for the wreck. They found the ship had been burnt down to the water's edge by the Malays. They, however, saved forty chests of treasure out of fifty-five which were said to have been on board. Most of the ship's company were saved, one man only was lost in the ship, and five others in a small boat were missing, who were supposed to have taken some of the treasure. The greater part of the people went with Captain Wilson to China, and some were with Captain Lloyd. Saturday, 10. This morning the resource was sold by public auction. The custom at Batavia is to begin high and to lower the price till some person bids, and the first bidder is the buyer. She was accordingly put up at two thousand rix dollars, but to my great disappointment no one offered to purchase before the auctioneer had lowered the demand to two hundred ninety-five rix dollars, for which price she was sold, the purchaser being an Englishman, Captain John Eddy, who commanded an English ship from Bengal. If no strangers had been present at the sale, I imagine they would have let her run down to two hundred dollars, in which case I should have had no alternative. The launch likewise was sold. The services she had rendered us made me feel great reluctance at parting with her, which I would not have done if I could have found a convenient opportunity of getting her conveyed to Europe. Little as the schooner had sold for, I found I was in danger of having the sum lessened, for the Sabandar informed me that by an order of the council there was a duty on the sale of all vessels. With this demand I would by no means comply, for I thought I had sufficiently suffered in sustaining a loss of seven hundred five rix dollars out of the thousand by the purchase and sale of the vessel, she having cost a thousand rix dollars. This day Thomas Hall, whom I had sent to be taken care of at the hospital, died. He had been ill of a flux from the time of our arrival at Timor. Monday, 12. I agreed with the captain of the packet for a passage to Europe for myself, my clerk, and a servant. The Sabandar informed me it was necessary that my officers and people should be examined before a notary respecting the loss of the bounty, as otherwise the governor and council were not legally authorized to detain her if she should be found in any of the Dutch settlements. They were therefore at my desire examined, and afterwards made affidavit before the governor and council at the Stadt House. My officers complaining to me of the unreasonableness of some tradesmen's bills, I spoke to the Sabandar. A bill of fifty-one dollars for five hats he reduced to thirty dollars, and in other articles made proportionable deductions. Paper money is the currency of Batavia, and is so understood in all bargains. At this time paper was a twenty-eight percent discount. There is likewise a difference in the value of the ducatoons which at Batavia is eighty stivers, and in Holland only sixty-three stivers, this occasions a loss of twenty-one and one-quarter per cent on remittance of money. It therefore follows that if any person at Batavia remits money by bills of exchange to Europe, they lose by the discount and the exchange forty-nine and one-quarter per cent. 
those who have accounts to pay and can give unexceptionable bills on europe will find a considerable savings by negotiating their bills with private people who are glad to give them a premium of twenty per cent at the least this discovery i made somewhat too late to profit by one of the greatest difficulties that strangers have to encounter is their being obliged to live at the hotel this hotel was formerly two houses which by doors of communication have been made one it is in the middle of a range of buildings more calculated for a cold country than for such a climate as batavia there is no free circulation of air and what is equally bad it is always very dirty and there is a great want of attendance what they call cleaning the house is another nuisance for they never use any water to cool it or to lay the dust but sweep daily with brooms in such a manner that those in the house are almost suffocated by a cloud of dust the months of december and january are reckoned the most unhealthy of the year the heavy rains being then set in the account of the seasons is given to me here i believe may be relied on the middle of november the west monsoon begins and rain december and january continual rain with strong westerly wind february westerly wind towards the end of this month the rain begins to abate march intervals of fine weather wind westerly april in this month the east monsoon begins weather generally fine with showers of rain may east monsoon fixed showery june and july clear weather strong east wind august and september wind more moderate october in this month the wind begins to be variable with showers of rain the current is said always to run with the wind nevertheless i found the reverse in sailing from timor to java between the end of october and the beginning of the ensuing year no dutch ship bound for europe is allowed to sail from batavia for fear of being near the Mauritius at the time of the hurricanes which are frequent there in december and january my illness prevented me from gaining much knowledge of batavia of their public buildings i saw nothing that gave me so much satisfaction as their country hospital for seamen it is a large commodious and airy building about four miles from the town close to the side of the river or rather in the river for the ground on which it stands has by labor been made an island of and the sick are carried there in a boat each ward is a separate dwelling and the different diseases are properly classed they have sometimes one thousand four hundred patients in it at this time there were eight hundred but more than half of those were recovered and fit for service of whom three hundred were destined for the fleet that was to sail for europe i went through most of the wards and there appeared great care and attention the sheets bedding and linen of the sick were perfectly neat and clean the house of the physician mr sparling who has the management of the hospital is at one extremity of the building and here it was that i resided to the attention and care of this gentleman for which he would receive no payment i am probably indebted for my life the hospital in the town is well attended but the situation is so ill chosen that it certainly would be the saving of many lives to build one in its stead up the river which might be done with great advantage as water carriage is so easy and convenient a great neglect in some of the commanders of the shipping here was suffering their people to go dirty and frequently without frock shirt or anything to cover their bodies which besides being a public nuisance must probably be productive of ill health in the most robust constitution the governor-general gave me leave to lodge all my people at the country hospital which i thought a great advantage and with which they were perfectly satisfied the officers however at their own request remained in the town the time fixed for the sailing of the packet approaching i settled my accounts with the sabandar leaving open the victualling account to be closed by mr fryer the master previous to his departure who i likewise authorized to supply the men and officers left under his command with one month's pay 
to enable them to purchase clothing for their passage to England. I had been at great pains to bring living plants from Timor in six tubs, which contained jacks, nankas, carabolas, namnams, jambos, and three thriving breadfruit plants. These I thought might be serviceable at the Cape of Good Hope, if brought no farther, but I had the mortification of being obliged to leave them all at Batavia. I took these plants on board at Kapang on the 20th of August. They had experienced a passage of 42 days to my arrival here. The breadfruit plants died to the root and sprouted afresh from thence. The carabolas, jacks, nankas, and namnams I had raised from the seed, and they were in fine order. No judgment can hence be formed of the success of transporting plants, as in the present trial they had many disadvantages. Friday, 16. This morning being sunrise, I embarked on board the Vallied packet, commanded by Captain Peter Corrette, bound for Middleburg. With me likewise embarked Mr. John Samwell, clerk, and John Smith, seaman. Those of our company who stayed behind the governor promised me should follow in the first ships and be as little divided as possible. At seven o'clock the packet weighed and sailed out of the road. Sunday, 18. On the 18th we spoke the Rambler, an American brig belonging to Boston, bound to Batavia. After passing the Straits of Sunda, we steered to the north of the Cocos Isles. These islands, Captain Couvret informed me, are full of coconut trees. There is no anchorage near them but good landing for boats. Their latitude 12 degrees 0 minutes south, longitude 96 degrees 5 minutes east. In the passage to the Cape of Good Hope there occurred nothing worth remark. I cannot, however, forbear noticing the Dutch manner of navigating. They steer by true compass, or rather endeavor to do so, by means of a small movable central card which they set to the meridian, and whenever they discover the variation is altered two and a half degrees since the last adjustment, they again correct the central card. This is steering within a quarter of a point without aiming at greater exactness. The officer of the watch likewise corrects the course for leeway by his own judgment before it is marked down in the log board. They heave no log. I was told that the company do not allow it. Their manner of computing their run is by means of a measured distance forty feet along the ship's side. They take notice of any remarkable patch of froth when it is abreast the foremost end of the measured distance, and count half seconds till the mark of froth is abreast the after end. With the number of half seconds thus obtained, they divide the number 48, taking the product of the rate of sailing in geographical miles in one hour, or the number of Dutch miles in four hours. It is not usual to make any allowance to the sun's declination on account of being on a different meridian from that for which the tables are calculated. They in general compute with the numbers just as they are found in the table. From all this it is not difficult to conceive the reason why the Dutch are frequently above ten degrees out of their reckoning. Their passages likewise are considerably lengthened by not carrying a sufficient quantity of sail. December 16. In the afternoon we anchored in Table Bay. December 17. The next morning I went on shore and waited on His Excellency M. Van der Graaf, who received me in the most polite and friendly manner. The Guardian, commanded by Lieutenant Ra, had left the Cape about eight days before with cattle and stores for Port Jackson. This day, anchored in Table Bay, the Astri, a French frigate commanded by the Count de saint Revel from the Isle of France, on board of which ship was the late governor, the Chavier de Entrecaste. The other ships that arrived during my stay at the Cape were a French 40-gun frigate, an East India ship, and a brig of the same nation, likewise two other French ships with slaves from the coast of Mozambique, bound to the West Indies, a Dutch packet from Europe, after a four months' passage, and the Harpy, a South Sea whaler with four hundred barrels of spermaceti and four hundred of seal and other oils. 
There is a standing order from the Dutch East India Company that no person who takes a passage from Batavia to Europe on any of their ships shall be allowed to leave the ship before she arrives at her intended port. According to this regulation, I must have gone to Holland in the packet. Of this I was not informed till I was taking leave of the Governor-General at Batavia, when it was too late for him to give the captain an order to permit me to land in the channel. He, however, desired I would make use of his name to Governor Van der Graaf, who readily complied with my request and gave the necessary orders to the captain of the packet, a copy of which His Excellency gave to me, and at the same time recommendatory letters to people of consequence in Holland, in case I should be obliged to proceed so far. I left a letter at the Cape of Good Hope to be forwarded to Governor Phillips at Port Jackson for the first opportunity, containing a short account of my voyage with the descriptive list of the pirates, and from Batavia I had written to Lord Cornwallis, so that every part of India will be prepared to receive them. Saturday, 2. We sailed from the Cape in company with the Astri French frigate. The next morning neither ship nor land were in sight. On the 15th we passed in sight of the island St. Helena. On the 21st we saw the island Ascension. On the 10th of February, the wind being at northeast blowing fresh, our sails were covered with a fine orange-colored dust. Fuego, the westernmost of the Cape de Verde Islands, and the nearest land to us on that day at noon, bore northeast by east, half-east, distance 140 leagues. When we had passed the latitude of the western islands, a lookout was kept for some rocks which Captain Coray had been informed lay in latitude 44 degrees 25 minutes north and 2 degrees 50 minutes east longitude from the east end of St. Mitchell. This information Captain Couray had received from a person that he knew, and who said that he had seen them. On the 13th of March we saw the Bill of Portland, and on the evening of the next day, Sunday, March the 14th, I left the packet and was landed at Portsmouth by an Isle of Wight boat. Those of my officers and people whom I left at Batavia were provided with passages in the earliest ships, and at the time we parted were apparently in good health. Nevertheless, they did not all live to quit Batavia. Mr. Elphinstone, master's mate, and Peter Linkletter, seaman, died within a fortnight after my departure, the hardships they had experienced having rendered them unequal to cope with so unhealthy a climate as that of Batavia. The remainder embarked on board the Dutch fleet for Europe and arrived safe in this country, except Robert Lamb, who died on the passage, and Mr. Ledward, the surgeon, who has not yet been heard of. Thus of nineteen, who were forced by the mutineers into the launch, it has pleased God that twelve should surmount the difficulties and dangers of the voyage and live to revisit their native country. End of chapter 20 a Voyage to the South Sea was recorded by Tom Crawford in Cool, California, USA, and proof listened by Sheila in Nottinghamshire, England. If you wish to learn more about William Bly and HMS Bounty, look up either one in Wikipedia. In addition, two other books are available on LibriVox. George Hamilton, Voyage Round the World in His Majesty's Frigate Pandora, and Sir John Barrow, Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of HMS Bounty, Its Cause and Consequences.